Okay, so this poem is for AQA students and it's on the Power and Conflict anthology and it's Remains by Simon Armitage. Okay, so as with all the other uh, poetry videos, I'm going to pick out the key, key points initially, so language, form and structure, and then I'll analyse the poem in a lot more detail, almost line by line, later on. Okay, so before we do that, uh, what's the poem about? Well, it's an anecdotal account as the narrator describes an incident in which he shot a looter and then explores the impact this event had on him even after his war had ended. The title, Remains, offers various interpretations or suggestions. Firstly, remains are what's left behind. So in this case, it could be the looter's body or the blood shadow or even the soldier himself who doesn't die but is left behind to deal with the emotional ramifications of what he's done. The dictionary definition of remains implies that what is left behind is no good and this could describe the soldier as a civilian who cannot cope and resorts to drink and drugs. Themes covered, effects and realities of war, memories, despair, guilt and individual experience as well. Um, the poem is based on the true story of a British soldier who served in Iraq and was part of a group of soldiers tasked with clearing a bank which was being looted. Okay, so it adds a a degree of authenticity to uh, the content. So, form and structure. There is no regular... Um, before I do this, I'll mention my method and meaning again. Method is identifying the poetic devices. Meaning is exploring the impact, the reason the poet has used them and the impact they have. So, there is no regular line length or rhyme scheme. There's your method which could make it sound like someone telling a story or reflect the lack of control the narrator has over the post-traumatic stress he now suffers. So there's your meaning and more than one interpretation. It starts with the first person plural we to perhaps deflect blame to others, but soon shifts to I, making it far more personal, almost like a confession. There are seven stanzas of four lines, followed by a separated couplet at the end, which lends a finality to the narrator's guilt and torment. Enjoyment is effectively used to highlight the ongoing suffering experience. Remember, enjoyment is a run on lines, no punctuation at the end of the line. And in this poem, it, it tends to not just be line to line, but stanza to stanza. In particular, between stanza two and three, and again between stanza five and six. So sorrow, which is any punctuation in the middle of a line, also serves to heighten this tension, as we'll have a look at later. Structure, the poem opens with an anecdote describing what appears to be an everyday event but quickly turns to a very graphic depiction of a violent death. The turning point, Volta, is at the beginning of stanza 5, where the narrator's guilt starts to take over. And we'll have a look at that in a minute. Colloquial language, which means like more conversational, informal language, Lexit, is used at the start to reflect the everyday nature of the event. It just sounds like a, he's, he's telling his mates a little story that happened to him. But the man's death is described in gory detail through very graphic imagery rips through his life, sort of inside out, image of agony, and tosses his guts, which hammer home the horrors of war for the reader. The juxtaposition of language from start to end highlights the horror of war, and could also reflect how desensitised the soldier has become to these levels of violence, so frequent are they perhaps. Repetition is used in stanza two, and somebody else, and somebody else, and three, in an attempt to shift the focus away from the narrator onto others perhaps. However, in the final line, the pronoun I emphasise how the soldier now doesn't blame anybody else, but feels the guilt of what's happened lies with him alone. OK, right. Oh, here we go again. Let's see if I can get all these up. Um, I'll leave it there for now. OK, on another occasion, we get sent out to tackle looters raiding a bank, and one of them legs it up the road, probably armed, possibly not. Well, myself and somebody else and somebody else and all of the same mi are all of the same mind. So all three of us open fire, three of a kind, all letting fly. And I swear I see every round as it rips through his life. I see broad daylight on the other side. So we've hit this looter a dozen times and he's there on the ground, sort of inside out. Pain itself, the image of agony. One of my mates goes by and tosses his guts back into his body. Then he's carted off in the back of a lorry. So on another occasion, one of many perhaps, um, colloquial language legs it, uh, makes it sound like an ordinary anecdote and just a regular conversation he's having with his mates. Um, probably armed, possibly not. 
And this is the insertion of doubt maybe feeds into guilt later. Did the soldiers have time to question whether or not he was armed? Well, myself and somebody else and somebody else who you've got casual tone continuing here as if it's not important, but repetition of somebody else and somebody else, the three of us. So he's very keen to let the reader know that it wasn't just him there, that there were more than him. So maybe the blame's not his, it's shared. Three of us open fire, sudden violence, end stops. That's a full stop on the end of the line for emphasis. Three of, a, three of a kind all letting fly, and I swear I see every round. So this is the enjoyment as the narrator's thoughts begin to run away from him. So he's remembering, he's recalling this image, and he can't control what he then thinks, how he feels. I see every round, I see broad daylight. Repetition, uh, which is anaphora as well, of I see, emphasising the visual horror. We've hit the looter a dozen times. Now there's, you know, three of them, a looter running away, They've hit him a dozen times. Excessive force, perhaps, but why? What's behind that? Um, inside out, sort of inside out. Unable to accurately articulate the graphic nature of what he's seeing. Struggling to process process it. Sort of his, you know, his guts inside out. And then we have and tosses his guts back into his body. That colloquial language, but it juxtaposes that the shocking graphic content of the action with the the kind of everyday nature of the language. Yeah, I thought there was one more. Uh, tosses the verb implies a disregard. Why? Maybe they may be desensitised to their or to what they've done and what they're doing. So regular, frequent, an occurrence is it? All right. Let's try this one. I can't remember where it ends. I'll leave it there for now. But I'm sure there's more. Uh, end of story. Except not really. So this is the turning point. This is the the uh, Volta. His blood shadow stays on the street and out on patrol. I walk right over it week after week. Then I'm home on leave. But I blink and he bursts again through the doors of the bank. Sleep. And he's ar probably armed, possibly not. Dream. And he's torn apart by a dozen rounds. And the drink and the drugs won't flush him out. He's here in my head when I close my eyes. Dug in behind enemy lines. Not left for dead in some distant, sun-stunned, sand-smothered land of, or six feet under in desert sand. But near to the knuckle, here and now, his bloody life in my bloody hands. End of story. So the impact of the incident doesn't end here. Uh, he's gone home on leave, but he's taking this with him. It doesn't stay on, in foreign soil. His blood shadow foreshadows mental torment to come. Um... Then I'm home on leave. Now, Sasora, that full stop there in the middle of that line. Sasora, after, uh, after the short, simple sentence implying the narrator, expects returning home to put an end to his torment. But it doesn't. Enjoyment between the stanzas implies the suffering is ongoing. Bursts again. So echoes physical impact bullets may have had on the looter. Sleep and dream, separated by Sasora, emphasising how this image is everywhere. There's no escaping it. The repetition of a line of line four repeats he's reliving the event again, probably armed, possibly not. So he's clearly suffering PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And the drink and the drugs won't flush him out. Desperate to find him, to rid himself of the image, but nothing works, whether it's medicated drugs um, or recreational drugs and drink. So he's clearly in turmoil, he's suffering. He's in here behind, dug in behind enemy lines, a, a war metaphor there that he's um, attacking him, the Im image attacks him constantly. Sun stunned, sand smothered, sibilant sand reflects something sinister. The long, tie long line reflecting the narrator's lack of clarity. And I think there's more. But also stunned and smothered, um, that language is quite, um, th those, those um, yeah, conjures up all sorts of um, horror images death but his bloody life in my bloody hands repetition of bloody reflecting its double meaning guilt and or anger and there we go my bloody hands the personal pronoun my owning the responsibility himself now he's clear he's reached that clarity but will that help him okay so there's plenty there 
Uh, just a brief summary then of the main poetic devices used. Absence of regular line, length or rhyme scheme, couplet, colloquial language, graphic imagery, enjoyment, thesaurus, repetition, anaphora, volta, anecdote, first person plural, first person singular, juxtaposition. Useful vocab to use when analysing horror, terror, guilt, consequences, emotional trauma, graphic, desensitised, haunted, tormented, nightmares, violence. And links to other poems, effects of war on the individual and war photographer, bayonet charge or exposure. Remember, the best advice to, when comparing poems is to think, compare them in terms of um, the content, the ideas behind them, not, not the structure, not the way they look, you know, like two sonnets or, or what have you. OK, um, that's, this, that's this one done. I uh, hope that's been useful. Um, see you for all the others. Bye now.